as well as structural homologies, there are other kinds of homology which provide evidence that different living things may share a common ancestry. We looked at some examples of behavioural homology amongst waterfowl at the Wildfowl Trust Reserve at Martin Mere in Lancashire. This is a Coscaroba swan, a South American bird. Watch how one partner shows aggression, defending the nest against our camera crew. Wings raised threateningly, neck arched forward. A quite different bird, the Australian black swan, shows its aggression in exactly the same way. Look at the raised wings. A pair of mute swans, a Euro-Asian bird, displaying in the same way. Raised wings, feathers raised to make the neck look thicker. While the black-necked swan, another South American species, exhibits again the same aggressive gestures. And this nene, or Hawaiian goose, also shows the same neck posture and thickening when it guards the nest. This is a very aggressive species and he's limping from some previous fight he's had. Different birds from quite different parts of the world, but all inheriting a common code of aggressive response. A more peaceful activity, bathing. This Chiloe widgeon from southern South America dips its head, flaps its wings, dips its head, flaps its wings. And this is exactly how other ducks of different species also bathe. The cinnamon teal, another South American duck, The white-winged wood ducks from Southeast Asia using the same bathing movements. And a Carolina drake from North America. The bathing motions are always head dipping, then wing flapping. This is a red-billed pintail from Africa. Screening the feathers also follows a very similar pattern across a wide variety of birds. The white-winged wood duck again. She stimulates a gland near her tail which secretes a waterproofing oil which is then rubbed off on the head and bill and used to anoint the feathers. This black-necked swan is using precisely the same motions. So are this New World Ruddy Duck and this Rosy Bill Duck. A falcated teal drake from Asia. And the Pacific Raja Shell Duck and Drake. While Ring Teal from South America use exactly the same technique. Nest building by swans and geese also illustrates behavioural homology. The black swan builds a nest by plucking off nearby vegetation and dragging it in to make a pile. This nest building technique is typical of swans and geese. The Coscaroba swan, from a quite different genus, builds the nest in the same way. Nest material is plucked from close at hand and pulled inwards. Nesting in the reeds, the black-necked swans have bitten off this clump of weeds to add to the nest pile.
The Cereopsis, or Cape Barren Goose from Western Australia, has inherited exactly the same nest building technique. The tall pile of plucked off vegetation comes from close by, as you can see. Homologies in behaviour can provide clues relating quite different animals. The Chilean flamingo doesn't much resemble the waterfowl we've been watching, but its nest building technique suggests a common evolutionary ancestry. The nest is a mud cup, and the mud is pulled in just as those swans and geese pulled in vegetation for their nests. Watch the bird in the middle. We turn next to a very different group of animals whose behaviour provides good examples of homology with our behaviour, again suggesting ancestral links. The primates, including the apes, like the orangutan, often appear almost human because they are in fact closely related to us. Look at the very human expressions of enjoyment on these youngsters' faces as they play together. and their need for mutual security and group cohesion, shown by the way they walk off together. Nearby, and again at Chester Zoo, a group of chimpanzees. This group of animals includes individuals of all ages. The adults exhibit a clear-cut hierarchy. The oldest animals are very much the bosses and will not tolerate interference by other adults. The youngsters, however, as in human society, are tolerated by their elders simply because they are youngsters. Watch this youngster tease this senior member of the group and get away with it. An adult plays with a youngster, tickling him and making him giggle. Just as adult humans tolerate, indeed encourage and protect their children, so do these apes, revealing very tellingly their kinship with us. And here a young chimp defuses a potentially aggressive situation when the adult takes offence at some behaviour by another adult in the group. Certain facial expressions are shared by apes and ourselves so that they can interpret our facial signals. This pig-tailed macaque is an aggressive animal. Watch how he reacts to an aggressive expression put on by a human being. There are many other instances of behavioural homologies between different animals which, like structural homologies, are best explained on the evolutionary hypothesis that the animals are connected by descent from common ancestors. At the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, something different. Work on proteins, which reveals further evidence for an evolutionary descent from common ancestors. This solution contains one of the haemoglobins, an important protein for many animals. We're using it to show how proteins can be purified which is essential for the work that follows. The peristaltic pump circulates the haemoglobin solution into the top of a chromatographic column where it and other substances present in the solution are held on the material packed into the column. An eluting liquid is then pumped through. 
This slowly separates the different components of the solution, which passes out through an ultraviolet detection unit linked to a paper trace recorder, which will indicate when the protein we want is passing out. This unit at the bottom collects the solution coming through as separate portions in a number of glass tubes. After some time, you can see that the red haemoglobin's now over halfway down the column. The solution falls drop by drop into one of the sample tubes. The machine counts the number of drops, and after a certain number, moves the next empty tube into position to collect another portion, and so on. Now the haemoglobin is going to emerge from the column. Like all proteins, it shows a characteristic absorption in the ultraviolet, so the trace will show us that we're now getting a protein. The pen has swept right across the paper. We chose a coloured protein so that you can see the protein coming off, but most proteins are colourless, and we need the ultraviolet absorption trace to show when we were collecting the protein we want. Here are the final samples. The trace shows us that there's no protein in these tubes. It's here, and even if it were colourless, the trace would still tell us in which tubes it had been collected. Now, what are proteins? They're extremely complex molecules, but they're all built up in the same way. They consist of long chains built from simpler molecules, the amino acids. About 20 different amino acids are the building blocks with which all proteins are made up. These amino acids occur strung together in different primary sequences in different proteins. This is an impression of one particular protein, which we'll come to later. It's possible for a given protein to find out which amino acids it contains and in what order. This is called sequencing the protein. Here at Caltech in Pasadena, the process is automated. The purified protein is in a rotating glass reaction vessel. Different chemical reagents in turn are fed in under carefully controlled conditions so that the long protein chain is gradually broken down into its constituent amino acids. The reagents are fed to the reaction vessel from here. And there's the control unit. This is what's happening. The protein is being broken down bit by bit and each amino acid identified as it comes off. A computer can be used to display the actual amino acid sequence for the protein being investigated. The position of the peaks shows exactly what amino acid has just been determined. The process continues. Another amino acid is broken off and identified. That second trace, just behind the first one, has peaks corresponding to a second different amino acid. The sequencer carries out in hours what would otherwise have taken years of work. As the amino acids are split off and identified, the picture of the protein is built up. This gives us the whole protein chain, which amino acids and in what order. Now, what's the relevance of this work to the idea of evolution? Well, it's now possible to sequence corresponding proteins from different animals and plants, and very interesting results emerge. Dr. Richard E. Dickerson of the California Institute of Technology. I think the first point to make is that we could look at the evolutionary history of life from any protein we chose, because we carry the history of our ancestry in every protein in our body. We're going to look at cytochrome C, which is a piece of the electron transport machinery that helps to bring um, uh, energy from our uh, foodstuffs and store it as ATP. But the main reason that we're looking at this is not that it's an energy storing protein, but that it's an easily extracted and isolated and uh, studied protein. Uh, this is an example of looking at something because in a sense the light's better here than somewhere else. But what we find out about cytochrome C could be found out about any protein you choose. Now this protein has roughly 103 amino acids and a heme group, and there's a package with a flat heme in the middle and the rest of the protein wrapped around it. And if you unravel this package and make one long string of amino acids out of the protein that surrounds the heme, then you'll see that the string isn't quite the same in man or in cow or donkey or 
redwood tree, they all have the same protein. And the more distant two different kinds of life are, the more differences you see in the strings. Consider man. This represents a molecule of human cytochrome C built up, like all proteins, from amino acids. Imagine it pulled out into a straight chain. Each colored segment represents an amino acid. So there's man. Now, if cytochrome C from a chimpanzee is sequenced, it turns out to be identical with human protein. There are no differences. The homology suggests again how close man and the apes must be. Next, take the horse. Its cytochrome has just the same basic structure, but there are seven differences in the amino acid sequence compared with man and the apes. Only seven out of 103 amino acids are different. The cytochrome from a bird has eight differences from the human protein, only one more than the horse. A snake. Its cytochrome still has the same structure, but now with 11 changes in the sequence of 103 amino acids compared with men. A fly. This is a very different animal from men, and its cytochrome shows 13 changes in the amino acid sequence out of the 103 present compared with men's. The further from men, the greater the number of amino acid changes. The sequenced cytochrome from a cauliflower shows 19 detailed differences from human cytochrome. And compared with man, yeast, a simple unicellular organism, shows 26 changes. These differences present striking evidence of how far apart any two organisms have diverged from a common ancestral stock of the evolutionary bush. So you see the record that's come out of this one protein in the last 20 years is basically the same story that's come out of classical biology in the last 200 years. Now, mind you, we wouldn't have worked this fast if we hadn't had the classical record to build on. But it's nice to think that it confirms the same story that we have. And if you don't like the story, you can search again with another protein and another. And the limit to how much evidence you can collect is how much work the chemists are willing to put into isolating these proteins and sequencing them and examining them. But the one thing we do know is that the same story has to come out of all proteins and it has to be the same story that came out of classical embryology and anatomy and comparative uh, metabolism studies and so forth because there is a history to life on this planet. We're just looking at a different record than has been available until 10 or 15 years ago. So I think the amount of evidence for evolution that's come about in the last 20 years as a result of these molecular studies is at least an order of magnitude greater than all the evidence that we've had up to this time, and maybe a bit more. And we've just barely begun our digging into the uh, history of life. The big advantage of something like these protein sequences is that you can put numbers to them more easily. And the things that classical biologists have been saying based on comparative anatomy can, I think, be said more carefully, quantitatively, by getting enough data from enough different proteins. So this is not going to change our idea of how life evolved on this planet. I think it's going to nail a case for it down to the point where there's, as they say in the, in the courtroom, no reasonable doubt.